Hi, I'm Steve Watson, the Maricopa County School Superintendent, and we are continuing our theme of exploring pathways to life and bioscience careers by hosting a career panel with bioscience professionals. And during this webinar, your students will learn from four professionals with unique and exciting life and bioscience careers. You will hear from Ms. Vicki Mayo from Touchpoint Solution, and Dr. Benjamin Rehnquist from the University of Arizona and Genity Rate and Dr. Seema Placier from TGen, and Bailey Belair from CND Life Sciences. Submit any questions you have for them in the chat box. And teachers, when the webinar is over, don't forget to connect with these industry professionals using our Educator Pro Connect platform. Let's check it out. All right, good morning, and thank you for joining us today for a special episode of STEM Pro Live. My name is Brian Hoffner, and I am here with four amazing professionals that are going to help us kick off Arizona Bioscience Week by talking to you more about their careers, their career journey, and a little bit of, about you know, what they do. So I'm going to ask my panel to all jump on. There we go. And uh, let's kind of really quickly just kind of do a whip around. And Dr. Pleasure, why don't you start uh, by introducing yourself and something, something about you. Yes, hi, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yes, my name is Seema, or Dr. Pleasure. And um, I am working, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. And I was told to think of something fun to tell you guys personal about myself. And so outside of science, my favorite hobby is dance. And my favorite kind of dance is hip hop dance. So that's something cool and uh, yeah, something fun that I like to do, so. All right, and, and <laughs> what, what is your title and where do you work? Yes, so uh, I'm actually switching jobs uh, next week, but my most recent title is I'm a computational scientist at the Collaborative Center for Translational Mass Spectrometry at TGen, um, which is the Translational Genomics Research Institute. And I'm gonna be a research scientist at ASU um, in the School of Life Sciences starting up here soon, so. Very cool. Uh, Bailey. Hi everyone, super excited to be here. My name is Bailey Belair. I am the Research and Development Manager here at CND Life Sciences. Uh, when I'm not in the lab or designing something new, I am either building Legos or playing basketball with my friends. All right, so Bailey, do uh, you play indoor basketball or outdoor basketball? Because I got to a point in my life where I couldn't play outside anymore. <laughs> Uh, the, certainly more indoor than outdoor, um, but during the winter, there are moments where outdoor basketball is uh, available. Okay, I'm, I'm very envious. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rehnquist. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Ben Rehnquist. I'm a professor, associate professor at the University of Arizona, where my lab stays diabetes and um, also animal science. Uh, I've started three companies, Generate, which is the one that you heard about, uh, Generate 2, which does very similar work focused on genetic selection in animals, and Live Endocrine, which is focused on diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure, which are two of the main diseases we see in the U.S. right now. Um, and something interesting about me, I've got a pet tortoise named Amigo and a pet turtle named Shelly, um, my niece named Shelly. Uh, I thought it was quite apropos. How, how long have you had them? Uh, we've had the tortoise for 10 years and the turtle for two years. Okay. Very cool. Uh, and Ms. Vicki. Good morning. My name is Vicki Mayo, and I'm the CEO and founder of Touchpoints, these wearable devices that alleviate stress in as few as 30 seconds. Um, something interesting about me, I'm actually a competitive horseback rider in the sport of dressage. So I've been um, riding and competing since I was a kid and love it so much. My horse that I currently have, her name is Aiden, and she's actually a horse that we rescued. Rescued from? From uh, abuse. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, each of your careers and, and what you guys do and where you work. Uh, so we're going to be sharing a slide here. And students, teachers, as you're listening to this, as you're watching, if you have any questions, please feel free to use that Q&A button. Uh, and once they're finished introducing themselves, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. So as we go through the career panel, we're gonna ask, uh, let's see, I think we, Dr. Pleasure is going to be starting this off and kicking us off for us. So Josh, I'm gonna let you take control and go from there. 
Yes, thank you. So uh, the title of my talk today is Discovering Relationships. So I just wanted to give you a quick few um, you know, notes about what I do. So I'm a computational biologist. Um, I'm a woman and a mom in science, and I'm a science educator. And so in that, I discover relationships between data, uh, between ideas, and between people. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. So this is just some, these are just some pictures to show you my career path, because um, that's what I'm supposed to tell you about today. And so the uh, first picture is of me at the beginning when I was about your age. And as you can see, I was kind of a dork. Um, but yeah, my favorite class in high school was computer science, uh, so much so that I went on to study that in college. Um, while I was there, I discovered that pairing that with biology was the most exciting for me. So I went on to get my PhD in the molecular and medical pharmacology department at, AS, or at UCLA um, doing cancer research. And you can see here a picture of me. Um, I was also able to do some wet lab research in addition to computational research while I was there. Uh, after I graduated, I um, became a full-time mom uh, to my two daughters. While the, my older one was napping, I was a bioinformatics consultant um, at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. And when they were both away, I've done a whole bunch of science educating, um, all the way from babies to college students. Um, and then when my younger one went to kindergarten, I started as a computational scientist at the mass spectrometry lab in Tijan. And that's what brought me to you guys um, through their education outreach department. So yeah. um, next slide, please. So to tell you guys a little bit about what I do for a job is I do big data science of cell biology. And so the way that that works is we take different tissues or fluids of biological interest. So depending on what you're studying, you'll pick out different things to, you know, the appropriate material to study. And so that can include tissues like biopsies from patients with cancer. Um, it can include fluids like blood samples, urine samples, cerebrosinal fluid, or even samples from non-human animal models developed in a research environment, such as mouse models of cancer. Um, and once you have the, the fluid or tissue that you want to study, you can extract uh, different biomolecules that are relevant to that phenomenon. And so that can include carbohydrates or lipids or proteins or nucleic acids. And then using a whole host of incredible technology that's being developed in the last, you know, that's been developed in the last 10, 20 years, we can get really high throughput measurements of those biomolecules. So that gives us lists of thousands and thousands and thousands of molecules to look at. And then that's where I come in. I use pr computer programming, statistics, statistics, visualizations, all kinds of things to figure out how all those measurements actually turn out to the different phenomenon that we're trying to study. Um, and that can be in health to discover you know, how certain processes work or in diseases or illnesses that people have to try to help make them better. Um, yes, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to tell you one little quick example to um, show you some of the exciting things that I've worked on. Um, one of the projects that I worked on was in melanoma, which is a cancer of the skin. And so when I was in graduate school, I developed software that allows you to compare two gene expression profiles. So a profile is basically an ordered list of how genes are turned on and by how much. And, um, and so what we did is we compared, uh, when I was at John Wayne Inst uh, Cancer Institute, we compared two different lists from cancer patients, uh, melanoma patients that had favorable outcome versus those that had poor outcome. And so we used two uh, data sets from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas and from NYU Cancer Institute in New York. And so using um, the software that I developed, you make these maps. And basically that red area that you see at the bottom corner of the map tells you that there are more genes that are in common between patients, uh, melanoma patients that had a favorable outcome. And so using our software, we were able to figure out what those genes were. Um, and then using more software that's published, we were able to figure out why some of those genes are turned on. And so basically what we found out is in those tissues, it was predicted that there were a whole bunch of immune cells. And so you can see down at the bottom, the length of those bars tells you that there's a lot of enrichment or more than we would expect of genes that are involved in T cells and B cells and natural killer cells and neutrophils and other immune cells. And so what we were able to do then is to go back into the clinic at John Wayne Cancer Institute and look at different um, biopsies for melanoma patients and then use different types of stains to look for whether any of these immune cells are in the patient samples. And so you can see in the column on the left, those represent three different samples um, for, from different melanoma patients. And the, you can see those brown dots. Those brown dots are cells that are dyed with uh, a chemical that marks B cells. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of brown dots on the left side, and those are all B cells in the melanoma tumors. 
And on the left or on the right side in the poor outcome or the PO group, you can see that there aren't that many dots. And so, and if you look, so basically if you use these sorts of experiments to stain cells, you can see that there's more B cells. And if you do the same sort of experiments with markers for T cells, the same thing is true. And so in that way, we went from developing software and using data in the lab all the way into the clinic and looking at patients and thinking of ways um, that certain patients have anti-tumor immunity. And so the idea there is you do experiments like this so that you can look at if there are any medicines that we can give these patients so that we can boost their immunity and bring more B cells, T cells, uh, natural killer cells, et cetera, to their tumors. And that will hopefully help them to um, you know, survive through this disease. And so that's, this is for me one of the most exciting parts of what I do, you know, taking research from the lab and into the clinic. And so with that, next slide, um, I, I, I will ask, you know, if there's any questions, you guys can ask me in the question and answer, set, uh, question and answer session, or here's my email. Um, and then if you guys find yourself at ASU, that's where I'll be starting in a week or so. So yeah, so that's me to give you an introduction. Hey, Josh, can you go back a slide? And so when you say favorable outcome, can you, can you elaborate more on what that means? Yes, so the technical definition in terms of this study is those that were alive at the end of that clinical trial okay. um, and then versus those that had passed away. But you know, different studies can use different measures to say what a favorable outcome is or a non-favorable outcome. It depends on kind of what you would expect for survival for those patients. You know, Some cancers are more severe, so people pass away very quickly after they're diagnosed and some you know, are less severe and people can go on. So it sort of depends. Okay. In this case, it's people that were alive at the end of the study. Very good. Thank you for that clarification. Of course. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions about the science or, or about anything else, really. So, yeah. Nice. All right. And I think uh, with that, we're going to kick to our next person and we'll ask all of our questions toward the end. Uh, so, Bailey, can you please join us? Hello, everyone. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I am the research and development manager for CND Life Sciences here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, next slide. I am born and raised in Arizona, so I went to Cocoa Paw Middle School, then Chaparral High School, and went down to Tucson to the University of Arizona, uh, where I studied biomedical engineering. And then after graduation, I ended up here at CND Life Sciences. Next slide. So my journey began in middle school. Um, I had a passion for building Legos, like I mentioned earlier, and was really passionate about science. And so as I grew older, I took a ton of classes where I got to work with my hands and build things and also study the, the biological and uh, uh, well, biological sciences primarily. And so as I got older, I really wanted to operate at the intersection of both building things, of doing science, and then doing a little bit of business. Uh, so next slide. So that brought me to the University of Arizona studying biomedical engineering. Uh, and while there, I focused on a few different research projects from organic chemistry and synthesizing medications for specific diseases um, to designing a lab on a chip, which is a small device that is utilized to mimic uh, human organs, uh, sometimes entire organ systems. Um, while there, I joined a ton of clubs. Um, I was the uh, director of corporate relations for engineering student council. I did uh, research over my summer internships and ultimately had a few occasions to present that research. Um, I got heavily involved and uh, it, it was an incredible experience. So next slide. So after graduation, I did not exactly know what my future held. Um, and so I applied for a bunch of different positions and ultimately I ended up at CND Life Sciences. So what does CND Life Sciences do? Well, we use skin tissue as a way and a window into the nervous system inside the human body. Um, and particularly, we focus on a group of diseases called alpha synucleinopathies. Uh, it is a mouthful. Um, and what that means is there's a group of diseases that have these protein deposits that accumulate inside nerves in the body. Um, one of those diseases is Parkinson's disease, and a few others are multiple system atrophy, autonomic failure, uh, and REM sleep behavior disorder, um, to name a few more. So we really assist doctors and we step in when neurologists don't know and they're faced with a diagnostic dilemma. The realm of neurology is very qualitative um, and there aren't many tests that give a definitive diagnosis. And so we here at CND Life Sciences are striving to bridge the gap 
between qualitative and quantitative. Um, so what exactly do we do? Uh, so move to the next slide. So a neurologist will take a skin biopsy um, and send it over to us. And that's where we process it with a number of chemicals and antibodies and such, and ultimately get a window into the nerves inside the skin. And so we look at a couple different structures. Uh, on the left, you'll see muscles. So these are responsible for your hair standing up and the goosebumps in your skin. Uh, next, we'll look at sweat glands. Um, these are the primary cause of sweat. Um, you know, when it's hot outside, it's Arizona. Um, so when you sweat, these are the glands in the skin that produce that. And then we also take a deep look at this very small nerve fibers at the top of the skin. And these are the nerve fibers that allow us to sense and feel and orient ourselves in our environment. Um, so these provide a lot of good feedback. Um, so next slide. If you noticed in the last image, we saw both red and green. So here at CND, we focus on a protein called alpha-synuclein and the red image on the far left is abnormal. It is misfolded, it, it is where it shouldn't be um, and no healthy person should have abnormal alpha-synuclein. So we see that this one single nerve fiber running through this structure is very positive for phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. And next we then look at the nerves. And we then say, does or do those deposits overlap with the nerves? And in the image on the right, we merge the two and we see, yes, they do in fact overlap. So in this situation, uh, in the images in the case that this corresponds to, the doctor did not know whether it would be Parkinson's or not. And so he sent us a skin biopsy and then we were able to say there is phosphorylated alpha-synuclein there. Um, so this would be suggestive of confirming a diagnosis of Parkinson's, taking the guesswork out of what could be five to six years to reach a final diagnosis. Um, so with that, um, you can move to the next slide. Um, here's my contact information. Um, and please add any questions you want uh, and I will answer them in our Q&A session. All right, Josh, sorry to do it to you again, but can you go back to slide? <laughs> All right, so while he's queuing up that slide, so Bailey, you gotta to talk to me about the colorization of uh, these microscopic slides, because I'm, I'm guessing they don't come out nice and pretty and just telling us the detection with color changes. So how do you guys, how do you determine it? And then how do you, how do you colorize it to be able to demonstrate it? Very good question. So we have optimized our processes to be as simple as looking at the color overlap. Um, and so the way that our science works is that the portion of our technique um, will illuminate the abnormal protein as red or orange under the microscope, depending on the filters you use. And then all of the nervous tissue, so all the nerve fibers and the structures that get innervated will show up as these green wispy fibers. And those are the nerves that are running to or from those structures. And so we really have a, a binary yes, no test uh, that says that that protein is there or it is not. That's cool. And it's such an effective illustration. So I love it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Josh, I apologize. Carry on. Dr. Rehnquist. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Rehnquist. I, as I said, I'm, I'm uh, with the University of Arizona. I'm an associate professor there. We'd love to have all of you uh, come join us to get educated here. Uh, it sounded like Bailey had a great experience and that's great to hear. Um, I've also started some companies based on my research and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about my history. I grew up in a town of 1200 people um, where my family owns a farm and a feedlot uh, I loved taking care of cattle. I showed cattle, sheep, and pigs in 4-H. So I was uh, your typical farm boy. I then went to Colorado State, if you can hit the down arrow, uh, to get my bachelor's degree. And I got my bachelor's degree in animal science because I loved animals. Um, go ahead and hit the arrow. Uh, after that, I moved out to California and I went to UC Davis uh, where I, I kept focusing on animals and what I could do to help the animal industry. I wanted to help family farms like my own um, to be more profitable and to take better care of their animals and to have more of their animals 
uh, survive. And so that was a big focus for me. Um, I learned how to uh, evaluate range cattle. I did some research in chickens, studying how to help them grow better. And I did research in sheep, trying to understand um, what allowed them to reproduce uh, if they had a good diet versus a bad diet. And so my, my degree was in nutrition there at UC Davis. And after being there, I moved up to Portland, Oregon, um, where I trained uh, as a postdoc researcher. And so after you get your doctorate, a lot of people go on and do a postdoctorate research fellowship um, where I worked with uh, mice and zebrafish. And so I've continued that love of animals independent of, of what type of animal I'm working with. Um, and so I studied obesity and what in the brain causes you to know that you're hungry or that you aren't hungry. And that was really the big question I was working with there. After I went to OHSU, I went on to uh, continue another postdoc fellowship at Vanderbilt University uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, where I learned to appreciate uh, country music and also uh, learn a lot more about some of the diseases that are associated with obesity. So less focused on what caused obesity and more focused on, you know, type two diabetes and hypertension, which are associated with, with being obese. And so obesity in itself isn't really an issue. It's only when it starts causing negative health consequences that we need to worry about um, someone, someone being obese because we don't want them to be unhealthy. After finishing up my postdoc at Tennessee, I went to the University of Arizona uh, where I've been since then. Uh, I now do research on uh, primarily on mice, but I do research on salmon, on rainbow trout, on shrimp, on tilapia. Um, there's a big tilapia farm actually just out, out near Gila Bend, uh, Arizona uh, that you may not know about, but if you've eaten tilapia uh, in, in Phoenix, you've, you've likely gotten tilapia from, from Desert Springs tilapia outside uh, Gila Bend in Agua Caliente. And I'm doing research in mice and I've, I've even um, begun clinical trials in humans. So, you know, that background experience and love for biology and love for animals created a, a research opportunity and, and, you know, has built my entire career. And, and that's really what's key to me is just a love of biology and animals and moving forward. And if you want to switch slides. So my advice to you is to build a strong base. Don't focus on any one thing at this point. I know that the desire is, I'm gonna to go to this university, I'm gonna get this degree, I'm gonna focus on this, and I'm gonna move up in the field. But if you can build a strong base, a broad base with lots of different types of experiences, you're gonna build a better uh, scientist and, a, and a, someone who's more well-rounded and better able to think, you might be able to come at questions with a unique perspective. Go ahead and, and hit the down arrow. And this is just kind of what I've gone through. I've gone through animal science, beef cow nutrition, chicken nutrition, reproduction, energy balance and obesity. And then uh, at Vanderbilt, the same thing and then keep going. And then now you can see I'm working on feed efficiency and growth. I've got research in cancer. I've got research still in reproduction where we're working to develop a sterilant for dogs and cats um, so that you don't have to do surgery on your dog and cat to eliminate them from, from making babies, but you can just give them a shot. That's the ultimate goal there. Um, and if you can hit the arrow a couple more times. So my obesity and diabetes and hypertension research has led me to st start a company called Libendocrine. And that's focused on developing new drugs that um, target that. And I should mention, um, you know, Dr. Pleiser is a computational biologist. I work with computational biologists on this all the time. Um, when, I, when I look at feed efficiency and growth, we've started two companies in that area and Generate, one of those companies recently sold. But to start that company, I found a biomedical engineer. Uh, to work with me uh, like Bailey. And so uh, you never know what type of degree is gonna lead you into what kind of research and what you're gonna end up doing. 
I would like to point out, Dr. Bailey was showing you those nerves um, that sense temperature, they sense pain. The Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was, was uh, awarded yesterday or announced yesterday, and it was for two people that were investigating um, both temperature sensitivity and pain sensitivity in those peripheral neurons. And one guy was using capsaicin, which is the, the spice in peppers, um, to activate these channels. And the other guy was, was poking with needles to activate these channels. But, but you, you have no idea where your research career is going to go, where your scientific career is going to go. Just be as broad-based as possible and don't turn down opportunities. That's all the advice I have. You can go on. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, Ms. Vicki Mayo. Well, hello. Thank you. My name is Vicki Mayo, and I'm the CEO and founder of Touchpoint Solution. Next slide, please. So you may be asking, well, what are touchpoints? Great question. So touchpoints are patented wearable devices that reduce stress in as few as 30 seconds. We invented this technology six years ago, and since we've helped over 3.5 million people stop stress and anxiety in their life. They also regain focus, improve performance, and sleep better. So unlike some of my peers that were very science-oriented from the beginning, my journey into a career in STEM and science and technology came about in a very different way. And today, I'm hoping that I can share this journey with you, but also help to inspire you because you are at a very critical point in your life. You're asking yourself the quintessential question. You know, what do I want to do? What do I want to be when I grow up? And I think that's a very exciting time. So I'm hoping by sharing with you my story, my peers sharing with you their story, we hope that we can inspire you and give you some encouragement as you take that next step in your journey. So my story starts when I was 12 years old and I moved from a small rural town in Georgia to a resort town called Sedona, Arizona. I had to start over again. New school, new friends, new weather patterns. Um, it was a very different time. But my parents did one thing, which I'm very, very thankful for. They enrolled me in the Boys and Girls Clubs. And at the clubs, I started noticing what interested me. And interestingly enough, it was not the art room or the game room or the outdoor rec activities or even the teen lounge. It was people. I loved people and I loved helping people. I became an informal sort of counselor. People would come to me and tell me about their problems and why they felt overwhelmed and we would brainstorm solutions. And I remembered that. I remembered that people are what interested me. And as you guys are taking that step on your journey, I'll encourage you, think about what interests you. What do you spend your free time on? You know, as uh, Dr. Belair shared, he loved Legos. Um, you know, as Dr. Pleasure shared, you know, she loves dance. Figure out what interests you and remember it. More than likely, it'll be a huge influencer in the next part of your life. So next slide, please. What I would also share with you is, is you have to be open to opportunities. So at Boys and Girls Club, I went off to college. I actually am a lumberjack from Northern Arizona University. And while I was there, I got two degrees. Neither was in a science subject. I was in political science, very different, and hospitality. But something that I really realized is you have to be open to opportunities because sometimes you're either going to take it or if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it. And in my case, the day that I graduated from college, I was 20 years old and through an odd circumstance of events, I stumbled into an apartment where I found two boys living by themselves. They were 12 and 13 and they had been abandoned by their parents. Their parents had been deported and left them in that apartment. And it was at that moment where I said, I have to be open to opportunities. And I ended up becoming an overnight mom. So at the age of 20, I took that opportunity. And will you just hit next? Well, perfect. This is what my life looks like today. So I am the mom to boys that are just a few years younger than me. And I have my own children and my husband as well. It's eclectic, it's different, but this wouldn't have happened. This joyous, 
fulfilled life if I had not been open to opportunities. So when things happen, good or bad, crazy or normal, just remind yourself that this might be that opportunity that I just need to take. So here I am, I've got these kids, I'm 20 years old, and I realized that they were dealing with a lot of trauma, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And as I got to know the foster care system and worked through the adoption process, I realized this is not a problem that affects my children alone. It's affecting millions of other people. And that's when I realized my passion. I paid attention to what interested me, which was people and specifically helping people. I was open to these opportunities. I ended up getting these kids and they taught me so much. And then I realized my passion. My passion was to find a way to help them. So I dug straight into science and technology. And what I discovered was that we could embed a technology into wearable devices that can stop stress in just 30 seconds. So we built that technology from scratch, patented it, and released it onto the market six years ago. That was my passion. And I chased after it and I pursued it. And today I am the CEO and founder of the company called Touchpoints. But I wouldn't have gotten here had it not been for understanding what my interests were, being open to opportunities. And then when I figured out my passion, I chased after it and never let go. Next slide, please. So today, I wanna encourage you to do one more thing. I want you to think about your Rolodex. So I had this passion. Um, I wanted to build these devices, but again, remember I'm a hospitality major. Uh, you know, I know how to build hotels, but I know nothing about technology. So what I did was I dug into my Rolodex. Some of you may have seen this before, maybe not. It was also it used to be called a Philofax. The equivalent of today's Rolodex is probably the contact section on your iPhone. A Rolodex is just basically an organization system for the people that you know. I'll tell you what, the only way that I was able to get my idea to reality was by digging into my Rolodex, which thankfully has some great contacts in it. So every time I went to an event and I met somebody, I would you know, jot down their, their phone number if I had it, their email address, their name, a few facts about them. And I would keep storing all of this in my Rolodex. So when I realized that I needed to build this technology, I opened my Rolodex and I realized I had met an inventor who knew how to do patents at an event. I realized I had a friend that I went to college with that became very big in manufacturing and supply chain. And I called these people and I said, can you help me? Can you, if you can't introduce me to somebody that can't. It was only because of this that I took an idea to a prototype and into development within nine months. So I encourage you today to build a Rolodex. Um, our call, my colleagues on the phone today, they all share their contact information. I'll share my contact information as well. And I share with this with you because um, I want you to, to reach out to us. You know, don't have to call us every day. You don't need to email us every day. But what we do want you to do is pull together a newsletter, send it to us every six months or every year. Let us know how you're doing. We want to be there to help you and to support you. And Josh, could you go back one slide, please? And you know, the reason is because you're a sunflower. I love this pictures of sunflowers because sometimes the world can seem like a barren place. It's like a desert and there's you know, maybe too much sun and not enough water, but yet a sunflower is successful. It not only survives, it thrives. And when it's watered and gets beautiful grass, it becomes an entire field. That's you. You're standing at this moment right now where you're a seed. And I have no doubt that you're gonna grow into a beautiful sunflower. You were made to change the world. And that's what we all know that you're going to do. So today, I wanna just remind you, be open to opportunities. Figure out what interests you. And when you figure out that passion, chase after it and lean on your Rolodex to make it happen. So thank you so much for letting me be here and share with you today. And, and thanks so much to all of our panelists and our amazing organizers. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Brian. Hello, the panel members to go ahead and jump back on. And Josh, if you could stop sharing screen, that'd be great. Well, thank you so much. What an amazing story and stories you guys got to share and so different in the way you did it. And I felt like 
Dr. Rehnquist was turning it into a little bit of a job fair as he was thinking about recruiting each of you for projects. Uh, and I, I, saw, I saw the wheels spinning over there and it kind of fits in with Vicky, what Vicky's talking about, building, building that Rolodex and figuring out who are these people that share these passions and share these ideas that you can have these conversations with. Um, we have a ton of our students and our teachers that are enjoying fall break this week, but they wanted to make sure that their voice was heard. And so they have been emailing us questions in advance and they're hoping to share this with their, their students next week when they're back from fall break. But a lot of the questions came from students who are thinking about um, doing partnerships or excuse me, doing mentorships or job shadowing. In other words, how do I get started uh, with learning more about these jobs? Is there opportunities where I could come in and do some type of job shadowing? Or is there things that I could do to kind of see what's happening more um, with boots on the ground and stuff like that? So what are some of the opportunities that you guys know of personally uh, with your, in your own companies or even outside of? Yeah, I have a great one to share for that, actually, because TGen has a wonderful summer internship program. Ooh, there's thunder outside. Um, yeah, and so I fully recommend that you guys look into that. It's wonderful. Um, it's, I believe, for late high school students and then also for undergraduates and, and college. So, you know, please do look into this. In fact, TGen has an education and outreach department that can connect you to a whole bunch of different internship opportunities. And so um, the Helios program, which is what TGen's internship program is called, basically pairs students with different labs. And so you get a mentor in the lab and you work for eight weeks during the summer full time. It's paid, which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, so you can go in and really like get in there and do things and have projects and they have you present in a symposium at the end. It's fantastic. It's like this, you know, like mad sprint to awesome research and you get a chance to really like do it yourself and see what it would be like to be a scientist. And it's awesome. So yeah. Uh, Dr. Pleasure, do you know, is that specifically for high school students or uh, can undergraduate students attend as well? Because one it's of our- also, students... so I think it's about, I think it's about one third high school students and two thirds college. So it's a little okay. bit more for the undergrads, but um, there's a bunch of opportunities for high school students as well. So, and really just in general, if you ever wanted to, you know, just like Vicky was saying, you know, if you're interested in somewhere or something, call somebody up, they'll give you a tour. You know, the education and outreach department in, in TGen will always give you a chance to go and see, you know, they'll take you for a tour around the building, show you all the different labs, you know, introduce you to people if there's specific work that, you know, oh yeah, I was Googling the sky and, you know, I'm interested in this thing and they'll completely set up, you know, meetings for you. The people will help you if you just let them know what you want. So, yeah. So I fully recommend, just like Vicky said, just call them up and see what's up because they'll show you around, you know? Yeah. But that nice. there's formal programs. I participated in a formal program like that when I was in college and it was amazing. And that was one of the big reasons, just like Bailey was saying that, what, you know, you do these, you know, you look at these different things, you try your best, you apply. And one of them will eventually, if you work hard enough, will hit. And then you do these things and it's amazing. And oftentimes you just get hooked and you can't stop. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Alex Haynes is one of our participants today and he's a student at Glendale Community College. And he asked a similar question, which is why I was wondering if that was more for high school or if that was also for, for college. Dr. Rehnquist, uh, were you giving a high five to that response or did you want to build on it? No, yeah, we, at University of Arizona, um, we have the Keys Research Internship which is for high school students specifically. Um, and then I think uh, Bailey mentioned the UBERP, the undergraduate um, research program that we have as well. So there are a number of undergraduate research opportunities um, and high school research opportunities. And then taking that a step further, usually if you're already an undergrad somewhere, just reach out to any faculty member you want, send them your resume, um, and tell them why, why you're interested in the research that they're doing. And they may not have a position available immediately, but within six months or a year, that it's very likely that they'll have a place in their lab and, and they'd love to have you join and help, help move their research forward. That's an excellent thought and suggestion. Thank you. Vicki, were you popping in too? Yeah, I just wanted to share. I absolutely agree with, with my colleagues that you know, you should reach out to anyone you're, you um, have an interest in or an area, but something that can set your portfolio apart is actually a platform where you can build a portfolio. It's called Circled In. It's C-I-R-K-L-E-D-I-N.com. 
Um, it's a great website. It's specifically for high school and college students and even middle school students where you can start building a portfolio right about yourself. It's almost like an interactive resume. And there's a lot of folks that, um, that are looking for interns and they're actually going on Circled In. So they have a lot of different partnerships with different universities as well. So that's just another platform for you. Yeah. And to add to that, LinkedIn is the one that you'll use as you become more of a grown up. You know, that's the one that we a lot of us use to, you know, find different people that are interested in this. And, you know, you can endorse people's skills, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, if you're interested in, you know, so and so as a computational scientist, this person's awesome. You know, they'll give like a thumbs up for that specific skill. So LinkedIn is another one that you can look at. That's also like an interactive resume. So, yeah. And, and Dr. Rehnquist, I know you're the, the leading professor here. Uh, but I hope you don't mind. I'm going to give all of you homework and I'm going to ask for you guys to maybe email me some of those things that we can put up on our website so that students can circle back and we can get some of those resources out there because I think those were amazing. Yeah, I also want to mention one that I didn't mention, which is more business focused. It might fit some of those students that are more interested in the business side of STEM is um, our technology transfer arm of the university also has internships that are focused on, you know, helping you evaluate a business and understand, mm -hmm. you know, a technology and see if it would make a good business. And so there are opportunities on that end as well. And I, I'll provide that information to you as well, Brian. Very good, thank you. So we have about 18 classrooms that are participating in our STEM challenge from last month, which was a bioengineering challenge. And the goal was they had to think like a bioengineer and they had to develop a solution to either students who were dehydrated, they were rehabbing an injury or they were trying to prevent an injury. And so. The students have to come up with their own scenario at their schools and their communities, identify what are the challenges or obstacles there, and then try to bring one of those into creating a solution. So as we're encouraging them to think like a bioengineer or think like a bioscientist, what would you encourage them at, at that? Like they're getting this starting spark. What would you do to encourage them to say, you know what, this is a, an amazing profession that you would really want to look into. So what are some of the exciting things that you would want to share with kids that are just getting a, a touch or a taste for this? Well, I guess one question that I would ask kids is so, you know, just like Vicky was saying, you know, what are you interested in really? Because I think the way that you find a job that you'll like so much that it won't feel like a job is to do the things that you like to do, right? So like for scientists, typically it's, we like to figure out how stuff works and, you know, it just starts there, right? And then once you kind of get into that, you start sort of looking around and reading descriptions of things, you know. So that's the other thing I was going to say is sort of when you're learning to think like an engineer, the, a big thing is to read. And, and actually, the truth is with any job, read as much as you can. Read as many, you know, Google everything, honestly. Like read about who's working on what and how things, you know, even things that you don't even think are fully, fully relevant. Read it first to see if they actually are, you know. Because I think that's how, how a lot of us start to really learn to think like engineers, like biologists, like we just read a lot of research that's been done and think about it, you know, and think about, you know, what can I do to work on that? Or how does that really like, you know, just asking people. So wait, I, I read this paper, I read this thing, and I don't really understand. Could you explain it to me better? And by talking with people, they'll get an idea of how you think and you'll improve the way that you think about science and work. So I just, I don't know if that's fully relevant to the question you were asking, but I really wanted to say, read as much as possible and figure out how stuff works because that's a big deal. And well, I think, all of our, I think all of our teachers in the audience are doing a little happy dance, especially all of our ELA teachers. <laughs> yes, so please. I think yes, they support absolutely. your message. Give those people a high five. They're talking mm -hmm. about good stuff. <laughs> Brian, I think the, the, you've got a really good example there with how do we um, treat someone who's dehydrated. And we can look at that and really the first dehydration products that came out were, were Pedialyte or those, but then Gatorade came out and that was huge. And that was developed by the sports nutrition department at the university of Florida. Um, and it tasted terrible. Coca-Cola bought it, made it taste better, made it more palatable. But if you have something that's great already and is solving that niche, what are you going to do to build upon that? What is that product lacking that you can do to improve? And that's kind of a nice way to start with, like, I think Simo was saying uh, that what you really need to understand is where's the current state of knowledge. For your example, we kind of have a product out there that really fits that current state of knowledge. And you can see what you can do to protect it in that. That's awesome. That's a great point, too. 
Vicki or Bailey, you want to add on to that? What would you encourage students who are thinking about? I'm going to echo that completely um, because that's that's essentially what research and development is all about. So what I do is we take a current state of knowledge and how things exist as they are now and find ways to tweak it and improve it. Can we make it a faster process? Can we make it a more accurate process? Um, you know, how, how do we make it easier for, well, for us would be for doctors, for patients. Um, and, and sometimes it's not tangible as in as part of a test, maybe we provide a better support network. Um, it's, there are any number of things and that's truly what boils down to, to research and development is understanding you know, what is the current knowledge base and reading about it. And, and it don't, in today's day and age, there are videos out there on it. So, you know, you can Khan Academy, anything, um, and, uh, and really learn without needing a textbook, without needing a class. Uh, for me, the biggest part about understanding what I was interested in is taking just a, a wide array of classes. So when it came to high school, I took real estate, human anatomy, um, and just kind of all across the spectrum to figure out what I was interested in and uh, ultimately landed here at this, this intersection. And one other quick thing I was just going to add before Vicky um, speaks is so, you know, one thing that to think about if there's some unique perspective that you bring about just by being you, you know, if you're, if you're walking into a room and you see that it's mostly one type of person, whatever it is, and you hear them talk and you realize that from your life, you realize, wait, wait, you guys aren't thinking about something. That's a perfect thing to say out loud, even if you feel a little uncomfortable doing it or if you feel a little embarrassed, like, is anyone going to listen? That's the perfect thing to talk about. Like if you notice there's something about you that people don't realize, say that out loud. It's it's a one way to make an impact as an individual, you know, just like Bailey was saying, you know. Yeah. Speaking as the the one who's always got a quick tip for everything. Um, you know, I think it's great research all those areas, but you might be wondering, well, how do I research them? Um, here's your quick tip for the day. Set up a Google alert with the with the subject of whatever it is. So when I started Touchpoint, I had a Google alert running for health technology. Six years later, I still have a Google alert for health technology. So every day, every article, news article, anything that comes online that has to do with health technology, I get notified of it. So I self-taught myself to be an expert in the field. So use Google. It's a great, great little uh, tool. That is awesome, ambitious, and sounds overwhelming. That's a lot of information coming in. That's, that's super commitment. So uh, unfortunately, we are starting to run a little bit out of time, but I want you guys to have an opportunity to kind of give a final thought to students. So what's a final thing that you would encourage students wherever they're at, whether they're in the elementary classroom, a middle school classroom, high school, or even at the undergrad for, for colleges right now, if they want to do a job like this, what's something that you would encourage them to do? And I know you kind of already touched on some of those pieces right now, but if you had a final thought or a final statement for them, what would it be? Since I presented first, I can go first. Um, yeah, so I guess what I wanted to share with you is so when you're going through your life, you know, uh, one of the things that I thought about, so my dad was a doctor, you know, and he, um, he encouraged me to be a doctor like every doctor does for their kid, right? But, you know, the thing is, for me, I didn't want to live the same type of life he did. You know, he was always on call. He was always getting pulled out of different things. And so for me, you know, I thought a little bit when I was your age about what I kind of wanted my life to look like, you know, like, do I have an idea what kind of hours I want to work? Or if I, you know, do I find myself to be better, like working on my feet or out in the field? Or do I want more of a, do I like quiet time? You know, do I want to sit at a desk and work? You know, if you have some ideas about that, you know, I feel like that is another way to kind of shape your career, you know, um, to kind of incorporate what you want in your life and how you want to live into your decisions about how you want to study and how you want to work, you know. So I just encourage you to take that time to think about that since you're young and, you know, the world is your oyster. So, you know, think about what you want and just get after it, you know. And if you need any help, you know, call on us. We're happy to help you. So, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add just keeping an open mind and embracing change and new experiences. Uh, you know, failing is an opportunity to learn something. So it doesn't mean you're bad at it. It just means you're one step closer at figuring out how to be good at it. Um, and, uh, you know, don't let that discourage you from doing what it is you ultimately want to do. Man, an open mind is such a, a key thing. What I hear in all of your stories, as it starts from where you first started to have an interest and sciences and kind of where you're at now today. And Dr. Rankos, we got to see your bouncing map all over the US. Uh, and I'd imagine that wouldn't have happened without an open mind. 
Yeah, and just following my passion. That's one thing I would say, you know, I love animals and that's what I've focused on. So follow something you, you really enjoy and find a job that fits that because it's going to make you happy. And if you have a job that makes you happy, you're going to have a much happier life. I would just leave everybody with, you can do anything you want to do and don't let anybody tell you anything different. That's a good sunflower comment. I can't, I can't, I can't top that one. So thank you guys so much for taking the time to come out and inspire some of our students that are sitting out there in classrooms thinking about what they want to do and where they want to find their own interests. I, I love the fact that you guys are offering such different perspectives and such different passions and pathways uh, as you're exploring these careers. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you students and teachers for taking the time to watch this whether it's today or next week after you come back for your fall break. Uh, this is our second event for our Bioscience Week. We have two more starting tomorrow. We have our next one, which is our after school panel, where we're gonna be featuring some of the high schools that are here in Arizona that are featuring some of these careers uh, in the classwork and the coursework that they're doing every single day. So if you're interested to see one of those high schools, please join us tomorrow afternoon. We will be finishing this off on Friday with our career panel, which is gonna be talking to those students who are doing our STEM challenge and kind of checking in with those kids and figuring out how their process is going and what are some of those products that are being made and giving them some suggestions. So that'll be happening on Friday if you're curious to see what are some of those things that are happening. So thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, thank you for those out in the audience. We'll see you later this week. With